to be absolutely penetrating to you if you really hear them in their fullness. And that's my whole goal. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so um, I'm going to ask everybody to please uh, pay attention to what it is we're going to be saying though tonight. It's going to be imperative that you, you know, you really listen. Uh, I can't, I can't say it enough. Uh, you, you got to be able to give God that focused attention to be able to listen to what you know God is saying in these verses. Because I really feel like the Lord is speaking out from the pages of Scripture, and it's something for us today. So I want to read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, because I think it gives us a sense of the times that we're living in, and we'll go over it a little bit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. I like the King James. It says perilous times. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Those are powerful words by the Apostle Paul. And uh, when you go to verse 2 and it talks about for people will be lovers of themselves, you know, this is one of, uh, we call it in, in theology, a classic Pauline list. And what we mean by that is Paul is known in his epistles of giving list. Like he'll list, he'll just list off a bunch of sins or list off a bunch of things. But when we read this in the Greek in verse 2, when it says lovers of self, that is like a head of the list. In other words, because people will be lovers of self, they will be lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abuses. You get what I mean? It's like the head of the list is lovers of self. It's not just like that's one on the list. That is the defining point of the list. You see? And so when we think about this, Paul is not writing about characteristics and conditions in the world. He is describing the characteristics and conditions of those that will call themselves the church. The book of Timothy or the epistle of Timothy is written to Timothy. Timothy was a young man who was sent by Paul to go and pastor the church in Ephesus. We know about Ephesus. This was a powerful church. This was a mighty church that from Ephesus we get the other six churches of Asia Minor. Paul did a ministry in Ephesus where he spent close to three years in Ephesus. And out from Ephesus, the gospel flowed throughout Asia Minor, all throughout the Turkey uh, region, today known as modern-day Turkey. And so when we think about what Paul is saying here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, he's not talking about the world. He's not trying to characterize the world. He's trying to characterize the church or conditions in the church during the last days. Now let's talk about that. The phrase, the last days, is the word last is eschatosh. You know, that's where we get the word eschatology from. Eschatology is the study of last things. But when you take eschatos, which is an adjective, and you add it to the noun for days, here's what that word means. It literally means the final age leading up to the return of the Messiah. So when Paul talks about the last days, he's not talking about the last Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the week. He's not talking about a last set number of days. He's talking about the last and final age leading up to the return of Christ. And guess what? Paul wrote this at around A.D. 60, A.D. 59. So Paul was telling Timothy about the last days. <laughs> So somebody says, well, when is the final age that leads up to the, uh, to the return of Christ? It began at the ascension of Christ. Once Christ ascended, and 50 days later, he sent the Holy Spirit as a much rushing mighty wind. And what does Peter stand up on that day in Acts chapter 2? He says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about, that in the last days. Sorry. <laughs> I'll try not to move. In the last days, 
Now, that is just me. I'm going to just straighten it up. There we go. I got it. <laughs> that in the last days, that your sons and daughters will prophesy. So what Peter did in Acts chapter 2, he confirmed to us that we're in the last days. The last days began all the way up to when Christ returns. And I don't know if you think about this because we like to think of the last days that we're living in now. But if you were living back then, it was the last days that you then. Because see, if you take the stance that the last days are set up by technology, the last days are set up by rampant sin, the last days are set up by that, then what are the believers to do with this letter back then? Mm -hmm. I, if Timothy could be like, well, thank you, Paul. Uh, I guess I'll, will I be here when that happened? No, it was a warning to Timothy right now. Right now. So think about it, guys. The last days has nothing to do with now that we're seeing prophetic signs take place. The last days have to do that when Christ ascended and the Holy Spirit came and it began the church age. The church age is the last days. That's it. That's it. And so he says that during that during those last age, that last age, there will be perilous times. Perilous times. That's a better translation than the uh, 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 ESV. Difficulty. What does the word perilous mean? It means fiercely difficult to cope with or hard to bear, troublesome, and dangerous. Literally, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, uh, the same Greek word is used there, and it's only used two places, here and in Matthew 8, 28 by Jesus. I'm sorry, by the narrative of, 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 uh, of, of, of Matthew. And there it is talking about the two possessed men coming out of the tombs. It says that they were exceedingly for forceful or exceedingly fierce. The same Greek word that was translated exceedingly fierce is the same Greek word for perilous. <laughs> also, within the secular uh, 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 literature, the word refers to an ugly wound having to do with someone being assaulted. I just moved it. Did it go off? No. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right. It also has to do with, uh, uh, in the Greek literature, it means, it refers to, it's a word used to mean an ugly wound having to do with someone being assaulted or wounded severely. So in other words, when he says that the church in the last days, there will be perilous times in the church, literally Paul is telling Timothy in the last days, the church will be cut up. It will be gashed. It will be assaulted. And that assault began all the way during the days of Timothy. Okay? The understanding is that the church is going to be cut up. It's going to be wounded. It's going to be gashed. It's going to be hacked. How? By false teachers. That's the picture there. So the question is, well, what are we to do? If that's the last days, what are we to do? Well, we don't have to guess it. Guess what? Paul tells Timothy. Okay? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Notice he says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, this is power. Because notice the phrase, I charge you. That word, there is one Greek word. And it is an intensification of a word. It literally means to thoroughly bear witness, to give an accurate, full, and clear testimony. Listen to this. When he says, I charge you, he's telling Timothy, you are to be a thorough witness. You are to bear witness thoroughly. You are to give an accurate, full, and clear testimony of the word of God. Furthermore, the word is always in the Greek middle voice. I know you don't know what that means, but you need to listen to it, which emphasizes witnessing done with a high level of self-involvement 
with strong personal interests motivated. Now, let me explain to you what that all means in the Greek. When he says, I charge you, he's not telling Timothy, I want you to do this because you charged before God. That's one reason. That is the main reason. But he says, I want you to do this not just because you're charged before God, but because you want to do this. It is personally motivating you to do this. You want to fulfill your ministry. You want to be thoroughly accurate. You want to be clear as a preacher. You want to be a good witness as a preacher. You get it? It's not just you're doing this before God. You're doing this because you want to do it because you want to thoroughly bear witness to the truth. You get it? I think that's powerful, guys. Because he says you're doing this is done, the charge is in the presence of God and in the presence of Christ Jesus. Notice that. You're not charged before men. I know we do these ordinations, and there's nothing wrong with that because the Bible talks about that. But the real key is that as a minister, I am charged before God and Christ Jesus. And notice what Paul puts in there. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Meaning that you as a minister are charged before God and before Jesus who will judge you on the basis of that charge. What's going on? Is, is it went on? Oh, okay, y'all follow that? Very important. Please hear me. I want you guys to hear me because this is a charge. The charge isn't do this for your wife. Do this for the members. Do this because you are set before God. You are set before Christ Jesus, Timothy. Who will judge you? Wow. And he gives the charge. It's a charge of three things. Number one, it's a charge to preach the word. It's a charge to be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. And it is a charge to preach the word by reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with complete patience and teaching. That's the charge. Notice what isn't the charge. It didn't say, here's what you're charged, build a ministry. Build a big one. Get members. Create organizations. Create soup kitchens. Do humanitarian aid. Get involved with social justice. Get involved with politics. No. What is the charge of the preacher to preach the word? What is the charge of the preacher to be ready to preach the word in season or out of season? Mm. What is the charge of the preacher to preach the word? How? By reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with complete patience and teaching. Do y'all hear that? The phrase to preach the word in the Greek, listen to what this phrase means in the Greek. Here's what it means in the Greek. To proclaim, to announce a message publicly and with conviction and with persuasion. This word literally means to declare the gospel as the authoritative binding word of God that brings eternal accountability to all who hear it. I know y'all didn't hear nothing I said. When he says to preach the word, he didn't mean just open up the Bible and run over some scriptures. No, he's literally telling Timothy to proclaim, to announce a message publicly with conviction and persuasion. As a preacher, we are to persuade you. Oh, okay. I'm not here to have a talk with you. I'm not here to have a conversation. I'm here to persuade you to believe the truth. Okay. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm here to declare to you the gospel as authoritative and binding and to bring etern e eternal accountability to you when you hear it. To let you know that when you hear these truths from the scripture, when you hear the gospel from the scriptures, when you hear these verses, you are held eternally accountable to them. Meaning you will not be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know that. Even if you heard it, Nancy, and you forgot it. That's your fault you forgot it. That's your fault. If I don't remember what Pastor said, your fault. Because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Remember, what was the fear of the disciples? How can we remember all that you taught? Can you imagine walking with God in the flesh? And he's teaching you all these great wisdoms and truths. If you're the disciples, my God, you're saying you're leaving. How can I possibly remember everything you said? He says, don't worry. I'm going to send the comforter and he will bring to your remembrance. He's specifically talking about to the apostles. He's going to bring to your remembrance all the things that I have taught you. The Holy Spirit is there to do that if you care about it. He ain't bringing none of your remembrance that didn't bear witness with you anyway. Remember, Jesus gives us the characteristics of the four crowds. You have the one who hears it. They don't understand nothing because they don't care. They don't understand nothing because they can't bear to hear it. So the enemy comes and steals that words out of their heart. It don't even take root. Then you have those who are yelling so much and speaking so much. They receive it with joy, but they don't take any root to themselves. They don't. They, the word doesn't have any root. These are your yellers and screamers. And it's not taking root in them. And when persecution and affliction arises for the word's sake, the sun scorches the word and they fall off. Those are the people that are on the what? The stony ground. Mm -hmm. And then you have those who hear the word, receive the word, but because they're caught up in the cares of this world, the lust of the, the desire for riches and the lust for other things, Elder Charles, guess what? The word slowly comes, uh, the world comes in and chokes that word out of them, and it doesn't produce any fruit. The good ground hearers are those who hear the word, receive the word, as Luke says in Luke chapter 8, and with patience bring forth much fruit. Well, guess what? We got to preach the word. Amen. And then Paul says you ought to preach the word in season and out of season. What does that mean? Literally, go look it up. It means favorable or unfavorable. Yeah. Convenient or inconvenient. Welcome or unwelcome. In other words, as preachers that have been charged before God, we are not to preach messages that people want to hear. We preach the Bible. As the preacher, you could care less what the people want to hear. I don't care what you want to hear. Because my charge isn't before you, it is before God. That's what he's telling Timothy. That's what he's telling Timothy. He says, you're not there to preach what people want to hear. You're there to preach the word. You ain't even there, Timothy, to preach what you want to preach. Mm. We're not here to hear your story. Mm. Nobody cares about your testimony. <laughs> Nobody cares about how you were blessed that week. Nobody cares about how rich you are. Nobody cares about what God did for you. We want to hear the word from you, preacher. Amen. We want you to walk us through these scriptures. Because that's the charge. And that's the charge that everybody who says that they are a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, a deacon, an elder, that is the charge that you will stand before God and give account of. God will not give, you will not stand before God and give an account of how big you built your church. Or how many people you helped. And look at this. He doesn't leave it for the imagination. He gives you three characteristics of how you ought to preach that word in season of out of season. Number one, you ought to reprove. Say reprove. In the Greek, this word means to show ones their faults. To convince with solid, compelling evidence the faults of another. 
as a preacher, when I preach the word, I am preaching it to show you your faults. To show you how your thinking may not be lining up with the truth. I'm not preaching it to show what you already agree with. This is how you know when people aren't really hearing the truth. They, 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 everything they agree with. I mean, you hadn't even heard what I said. The word of God has to challenge your thinking. When you come to this church, your thinking needs to be challenged. You need to leave out being challenged in your thinking, in your worldview. That's what the word reproof means. It means to show one their, their faults. Number two, he says, you preach the word, what? Rebuking. In the Greek, that word rebuke means to warn in order, in order to prevent something from going wrong. That's what the word rebuke means. Rebuke means to warn you. To warn you that if you continue to go down that path, if you continue to stay in that sin, if you continue to stay in that view, if you continue to follow that false teacher, that false doctrine, it's going to lead you to a path of ruin. That's the preacher's job. That's rebuking. Number three, exhort. Oh, hallelujah, pastor. Exhort. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> exhort there is the positive. But listen to what it means in the Greek. It doesn't mean like our English word exhort. What do we, when we think of exhort in English, it means to encourage or uplift. Mm -hmm. But in the Greek, this word carries, look it up, be a Berean, go look it up. It carries a legal overtone, which means that I am to charge you are to call believers to offer up evidence of their salvation that will stand up in God's court. When I exhort you, I am calling you and encouraging you to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. I am calling you and encouraging you to make sure that you make sure your election. You get it? I'm encouraging you to bring forth fruit that backs up your confession of faith. That's the encouragement that you give the believer. That's the encouragement. The encouragement ain't got nothing to do with this world. I am not here to encourage you that you're going that, 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 that you climbing up the rough side of the mountain and you about to go down the back side of it. I'm not here to encourage you that everything going to be all right. I'm not here to encourage you that you're going to get muddy. I'm not here to encourage you that God's going to heal your body. I'm not here to encourage you that your child is going to know the Lord. I'm not here to encourage you that your husband or wife is not going to leave you. I'm not here to encourage you in any of that. Because guess what? If I say any of that, I'm just guessing. I'm giving you a false hope that may not be true. Mm. I'm here to encourage. I'm here to encourage you to bring forth fruit worthy of your repentance. I'm here to tell you if you are a believer, act like it. If you believe the word, stand on it. If you say you are a believer of Jesus Christ, then here's the deal, guys. Let the fruit of the Spirit be shown forth in your life. If you are the light of the world, then get it out from under the bushel and let it shine. If you are the salt of the earth, don't lose your savior, man, because it's going to be trampled underfoot. You see, that's the encouragement you give the believer. Guys, preaching isn't a spiritual pep rally. Preaching isn't a time for life coaching. It isn't a time for self-empowerment. It's, it's a time for reproof, rebuke, exhortation from the Bible, whether people want to hear it or not. And notice that Paul says to do it with complete patience in teaching. Listen to this. The phrase complete patience in the Greek means long-suffering, but it also carries with it, watch this, Lindsay. When he says to do it, Timothy, I want you to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, whether people want to hear it or not. But I want you to be patient. 
Why does he say that? It, not, it doesn't just mean to be long-suffering. It means not to take things personal when preaching the word that's not received. Mm. In other words, he's telling Timothy when he says with complete patience, I want you to be long-suffering because people ain't going to receive what you got to say. Don't take it personal. Don't get upset with the people that now you're yelling at them and you're just all oh, you're mad at them and you go off on them. Y'all exactly on the charge. You get frustrated. That's a good word for preachers. If you're preaching the truth, don't get frustrated. Don't take it personally. If people, you know, if, if people don't want to hear the word, fine. That's them. But Timothy, you preach it. And then he says, I want you to teach. Notice this. This is this debunks the myth that preaching and teaching are different. Because notice he says, preach the word and I want you to do it with complete patience and teaching. Mm -hmm. The word teach can also be translated instruction. And here it means to instruct from the word of God what is right according to the truth. In other words, if I've just reproved you, if I've just rebuked you, if I've just exhorted you to bring forth fruit worthy of your repentance, the next question the elder should be, okay, well, what am I to do? I'm to walk you through the word of God and to show you what the Bible says you ought to bring forth. That's teaching. <laughs> teaching is when we work through the word of God and we say, okay, here, here's what you need to bring forth. Here, well, what fruit do I need to bear, elder trust? Here's the fruit of the spirit. So then we go over love, we go over joy, we go over peace, faithfulness, you see? You, you see, that's the teaching, but it's in connection with the preaching. Because I used to always get that. Oh, see, you're just a, pre you're just a teacher, Pastor. I'm more of a preacher. As if it's something different. <laughs> okay. The teacher preach and the preacher teach. Amen. Oh, no, I know what you mean. The preacher kind of walk around with no Bible. Oh, okay. And who? <laughs> the preacher tune up to the piano. The teacher don't tune up with the piano. He just kind of walk, monotone. Just talk. No, guys. They're both the same. Well, somebody going to easily say, well, man, I mean, nobody going to want to hear this. Well, look at the next verse. Look at verses 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions mm. and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Mm. Notice the driving motive as to why people will no longer endure sound teaching. Notice he says that for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Why will they not be able to endure sound teaching? Paul gives us two, he gives Timothy two motives for it. Number one, it is because they have itching ears. Mm -hmm. And number two, they want to suit their own desires. Now listen up close. The phrase having itching ears in the Greek is one Greek word, and it literally is an expression that means to have a desire that needs to be pleased or satisfied. When I looked it up in the Greek, it says the understanding is that something itches on your body and you will do anything necessary to soothe it. <laughs> Anybody ever had your back it? Uh -huh. What? Yeah. Have you ever seen people, man, when they sitting in the uh -huh. seat, man, you would, how, how many of you all can sit there with an itch and not scratch it? Uh -huh. you, I want you to try it. I want you to go home and have something with this, your hair, your back, and you say, I'm not going to scratch it. Man, you, uh, you just gonna feel like your whole skin is falling apart. That's the that's the expression that he's using. He says these people have itching ears, meaning that they they they, 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 they just so antsy. They just oh God, they just they just gotta soothe this desire. Go look it up. Sometimes I, I, y'all may think I don't look this stuff up. That I, I, I do look it up. And I look it up in this Greek context. And notice this. It says, because they have these itching ears, Lindsay, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own lust. Watch this. It is because they have this desire that is so strong in them that needs to be pleased, not with the truth of the word of God, but they want to be pleased with the myths 
from the false teachers. Did you hear that, Nancy? It's the myths that soothes the itch. It is not the word that soothes, soothes the itch. It's the lies of the false teachers that soothes it. It's hearing the false teacher, that's it, that's, that's what I needed. No, what you needed was reproof and rebuke. But because you and I both don't want that, let me go to some false doctrine. To heap up to themselves. That's an interesting word. One word in the Greek. And it means to amass in large quantities. It carries with it the idea that the hearers invite and shape their own preachers to their desires. Not in accordance with the preaching of the word. In other words, you will heap up to yourself the preacher that's telling you what you want to hear. That preacher will grow. That preacher will grow big. That preacher will become mega. He will become a celebrity. Y'all still with me? That's the word. Listen to Jeremiah 5, verses 30 through 31. And this is what Jeremiah gives an indictment to the people of Israel. These are the people of Judah. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. What has happened? The prophets prophesied falsely. And the priests rule at their discretion. And my people love to have it so. But you will, but what will you do when the end comes? That's what Jeremiah says to the people. Jeremiah says, Oh, a horrible thing is happening in the land. Well, what is it, Mom? The prophets are prophesying falsely, and the priests are ruling at their own discretion. And guess what, Lindsay? The people love it. How does apostasy come into the church? <laughs> through applause. How does apostasy grow in the church? Through, amen, that's right. The last thing in the phrase is they will turn away from listening to the truth and run their off into myths. Wow. Wow. The phrase will turn away in the Greek means to reject with contempt, to depart with scorn or disdain. Listen to this, guys. They don't turn away accidentally. They turn with disdain towards the truth. The word apostasy does not necessarily mean to turn away from Christ or to reject Christ. Did y'all know that? The word apostasy literally means to turn away from the truth. Okay. To reject and turn away from sound doctrine. That's what apostasy is. When the Bible says that a great falling away is going to happen, here's what we always thought. And it is that, that the falling away will be a bunch of people leaving the church who, who, who no longer confess their salvation. Or we will, from biblically, we know that if a person was to no longer confess their salvation, what would that prove? They never were saved in the first place. Remember, that's 1 John chapter 2, that those who have left us only prove to show that they were never of us in the beginning. You get it? So what does true apostasy mean? It means to turn away from the truth. To turn away from sound doctrine. In the last days, there will be a great falling away. There will be a great falling away from the truth. Are y'all hearing me? Uh, uh, from the truth, from sound doctrine. Somebody said, well, when that's going to happen, Pastor? Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, no, that's right. <laughs> Listen to what A.W. Tozer wrote. He wrote this, So skilled is error at, in, at imitating the truth that the two are constantly being mistaken for each other. It takes a sharp eye these days to know which brother is Cain and which one is Abel. All right. Amen. <laughs> How can you tell Cain from Abel? Can we go biblical? 
Matthew chapter 13, how do you tell the wheat from the tare? Jesus says you can't. He says, what did he say, Elder Linda? Let them grow up together. Because if you try to root up a tear, you gonna pull up. You may pull up a weed. In other words, Nancy, they're going to, in the they're gonna be so closely intertwined, look almost the same that you ain't gonna be able to tell who's which. You're not gonna be able to tell, guys, who who's the apostate, and because because the apostate's still gonna be in church. They just have left sound. They've left sound doctrine. They've left truth. And they're going to wander off into myths. That doesn't mean to be led off. The word wander off doesn't mean, I know, you know, that's our English, like to wander off means that, you know, you're just walking in the woods and then you wandered off and you got lost. That's not what that word means in the Greek. That word in the Greek is one Greek word and it means to turn oneself towards. Listen, you didn't wander off. You turned yourself towards the, the false doctrine. You turned yourself forward the, toward this, the, the, the false teaching. You, you turned yourself away from the truth. You did it. In the last days, people in the church will not only turn themselves away from listening to the truth, but they will wittily and eagerly turn themselves to listening to myths. What are the word? That word myth is the Greek word mythos, and it literally means something that is false, posing itself to be true. Guys, this is what it means to preach the word. Notice that we're just walking. We're, this is what we're expositing these verses. This is what they mean. And this is what Timothy would have heard. And if you think about it, when Timothy, when Paul gives this third warning, warning there, this is actually Paul's third and final warning that he gives about the last days. Do you know in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, he gave Timothy a warning? Did y'all know that? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, listen to what he says there. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting... How will they depart from the faith? By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Notice... Notice what it says, that in the last days, some will depart from the faith. How will they depart from the faith? By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, that's seducing spirits, by doctrines from devils. False doctrines. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that one earlier, he says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. So Paul gives three prophetic descriptions of the characteristics and conditions that will come to define the church in the last days. What are the three? Number one, people in the church will depart from the faith. How? By devoting themselves to false doctrine. That's the first thing that we can notice about the last days. That Paul says that people in the church, Timothy, will depart from the faith. How? By devoting themselves to false doctrine. How do they depart from the faith? By going after sin. No, by devoting themselves to false doctrine that then leads to all the other stuff. Number two, he says that the church as a collective whole will be full of self-lovers, lovers of money that will produce perilous times in the church. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3 when he says, know that in the last days perilous times will come. How are the perilous times going to come? Because during that time, Mom, you're going to be preaching to people in the church who are lovers of themselves. How many know, man, if you're preaching to a bunch of self-lovers, your word ain't going to go over too well. If you're preaching to a bunch of money lovers, pleasure lovers, how many of know, man, the truth of the Bible is not going to, that, that ain't going to fulfill the itch. <laughs> and then number three, Paul tells Timothy that the church will no longer, that in the last days the church will no longer endure sound teaching, but will instead turn themselves away from hearing the truth and wander off into myths. You want to say, man, is that really possible? Watch this guy. Jesus proves it as we, as we look. You want to know how Jesus proves it? To the seven letters to the seven churches. Paul wrote this 2 Timothy at around about AD 61, maybe between AD 61 and AD 63. We know 
that the book of Revelation was written around A.D. 91, A.D. 92. So that would be almost 30 years after Paul. So how had the church changed in just 30 years? I love it because who better to explain it than the Lord Jesus Christ himself? We think that Paul's letters are the last epistles to the church. No, we have seven epistles that come from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest of the church, the Lord of heaven, God in the flesh, who wrote, told John to write to seven churches. And notice what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, just right quick. It says, and I was on the spirit, in, I was in the spirit in the Lord's day. That doesn't mean he was speaking in tongues. That means he was taken away. He, this was a spiritual vision that he had. And I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man. Notice that we know that the lampstands in verse 20 are the seven churches. And notice that who is in the midst of the seven churches? Jesus. And what was he doing? Singing? What was he doing? He was clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. That's him being the high priest. His hairs on his head were white, like, the, like white wool, like snow. That's the purity of Christ. Meaning he comes with a pure motive. His eyes were like flames of fire. What is that? Penetrating judgment. Nothing escapes his eyes in his church. And when we're talking about his church, please don't get caught up in the building. When we say he's penetrating the eyes of his church, we're talking about you, the collective church. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in fire. What is that? That means that he comes in judgment to stamp out anything that doesn't belong in his church. That's why the Bible says that the vine dresser will prune the tree, the vine, so that it can bring forth much fruit. What does it mean to prune? Cut off. Then it says his voice was like the roar of many waters. That is the commanding voice of Christ. That means that in the midst of the church, Christ's voice is the only commanding voice. That's the word of God. And in his right hand, he holds the seven stars. That's to all the pastors. Christ said, I got you in my hand. Don't you ever forget it. And from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. What is that? That means his word is there to cut. He didn't say from his mouth comes a butter knife. Come to spread butter on you. Come to butter you up. No, it's a sharp two-edged sword. That is literally a, Greek, a, a, a Roman sword. The Romans had perfected their swords because on both ends of the blade it was sharp. Meaning that when they cut you, it would cut you going in, and when they pulled it out, it would cut you again. That's literally what Jesus says. I come with a sharp two-edged sword in my mouth. I'm coming to cut. Well, why are you coming to cut people in the church? I'm coming to prune. I'm coming to sharpen. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Notice that that's, that's what Jesus is doing in the midst of his church. Jesus is not in the midst of his church clapping to the songs. <laughs> well, pastor, the Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of God. Okay, I hope you don't think that Jesus is seated in a big chair in heaven. <laughs> I hope to God's sake that you didn't have a picture of a Masonic big chair that he's sitting in and, and God is sitting in a chair next to him. <laughs> I hope that's not what you would think. Please tell me you had more than that. Please, please tell me that that's not what we were all thinking, that Jesus is up in heaven sitting down in a chair, like what the preacher's sitting in, in the pulpit. No, guys, that is anthropomorphic language, meaning that it is a picture that Jesus' works are finished. 
that his work of redemption is complete. Y'all follow that, right? No. If you want to know what Jesus is doing, read Revelation chapter 1. That's what he's doing in his church. If you want to know what Jesus is doing in your life, Nancy, that's what he's doing. He's penetrating it. Judging it. Stamping out any areas of sin that need to be stamped out. Bringing the two-edged sword of his word. Cutting away anything that needs to be cut out. That's what he's doing in the life of his church. And so when we go read the seven churches, here's what we find out. That out of the seven churches, only two have nothing negative said about them. Smyrna, who is the persecuted church in Philadelphia, the evangelistic church. Notice that out of seven churches, only two get a good accommodation. What about the church of Smyrna? The church of Smyrna... It was the persecuted church. We know why they had only good stuff to say because persecution is a natural purifier of the church. How many of y'all know, man, you could drive out all false believers if they were, if, they, if you went to church every Sunday and they were killing people? Did, did, did you know if America would start persecuting the church? I'm, I'm not talking about persecuting in the, in the sense of they say you mean mean things about you. I'm saying, Nancy, they persecute you because they find out that you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you go to work, they fire you. Mm. They confiscate all your property. They round you up. Throw you to the lines. Or like Nero did, put kerosene flames on you and burn and, and set you on fire to light his streets up. Mm -hmm. If they're doing that to you, how many of them drive out the false people? <laughs> the false people are not going to stick around and get killed for something that they just playing around with. <laughs> so we see why the church of Smyrna is a perfect church because it was being persecuted. It represents the second and third century church. This is a real church in Smyrna that got persecuted. And listen to what Jesus tells them. Listen to what he tells them in chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for ten days, and you will have tribulation. But I'm about to deliver you. I'm about to set you free. I'm about to stand on high, and you will get out of that situation. No, he says, be faithful unto death. Meaning that they're about to start persecuting you. Well, what that mean, Lindsay? Y'all about to die. You're about to be killed, but I want you to be faithful unto death. Because I'm going to give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear with the Spirit. Okay. Can you imagine if you were the church of Smyrna and you heard that letter? Somebody would say, well, how did that encourage them? Oh, my God, for a true believer, that encouraged the daylight side of them. Why? That means Christ knows what's going on with me. And he says that's waiting on me as a crown of life, a crown of eternal life. What about the church of Philadelphia? This church is a picture of the true church. Notice that Philadelphia is on the tail end. Philadelphia is a church that is, that is dwelling in the midst of Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea. Wow, that's beautiful. Philadelphia is a picture of the true church during the final days of the last days that keeps the words of Christ about patiently enduring. Notice he tells Philadelphia this. Notice this. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, it says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who you say that are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast when you have had what you have so that no one may seize your crown. He tells the church of Thyatira, I'm coming. He tells the church of Sardis, I'm coming. He tells the church of Laodicea. Notice that these are the churches that will be representative, if you will, during the last days when Jesus returns. 
And notice that the church of Philadelphia is faithful because it patiently endured. Are y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. But the other five churches give us a progression of how churches begin to slide and downgrade into outright apostasy. What about the church of Ephesus? That's the first slide. What was it? It first begins with apathetic apathy and then leaving your love for Christ. Where does the slide begin, Nancy? Where does the believer find themselves sliding? First you become apathetic. Then you, then you slowly depart your love for Christ. The church of Ephesus did not just accidentally look up and find that they had abandoned their love for Christ. The Greek word implies that they willfully abandoned their love for Christ. Why? Because they had failed to cultivate it. They were just going off of yesteryear's words. Do you cultivate your relationship with Jesus every week? Or some of you come in on Wednesday still living off of Sunday's message. You ain't looked at nothing all week. And then you come in Wednesday dragging for another word so you can go to Sunday again. You want to know something, man? You do that, man? You're not, you're not cultivating your relationship. and You're going you to you leave your first love. Because if you're doing that, you're going to be sick of me. Only when you are immersing yourself in this word, yourself, when you are listening to other people other than me that are speaking the truth, you're finding other groups on Facebook to, to, to and other believers to, to dialogue with, other preachers who are preaching the truth. Mm -hmm. I didn't say TBN and Daystar and the, the word. Right. You're calling up Comcast, cutting them off. <laughs> I didn't say any big name preacher that's driving around in Bentleys and private jets and, 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 and living like Jay-Z and Beyonce. No. You're shutting them off because those are the false teachers that are leading people to hell. Oh, you got to cultivate it. Because notice what Jesus tells that church. He says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned your love. You had it first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Notice that Jesus. OK, the reason I'm going over this right quick is Jesus actually is doing what Paul tells Timothy to do. He's reproving, rebuking and he's exhorting. Well, where's the exhortation there? Repent. Repent. He says, remember therefore where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. That's exhortation. What's the reproof and rebuke? You abandon your first love. What's the rebuke? I'm going to come take my lampstand. <laughs> and what does, this, what does history tell us about the church of Ephesus in the 6th century? It ceased to exist. As a matter of fact, by the 15th century, the whole town was left in ruins. Well, what's the next slide? Then you, you, you skip over Smyrna and you go right to Pergamos. Listen to this, guys. Secondly, after you lose your first love, then you go to compromising with the world and with sin in your life because of the culture around you. What does Pergamos represent? It was the church, that the real church at the time, that began to compromise with the culture around it. Pergamos literally in the Greek means to marry. It is the time when the church married the world. It, literally, the word for the church of Pergamos is compromise. Say compromise. compromise. It, you, first, you, lose your, you start leaving your first love. And then secondly, you begin to compromise with sin in your life and you, because of the culture around you. You wonder what I mean by that? Why are you compromising Elder Charles with sin in your life? Well, man, everybody doing it. Man, the culture has it there. Man, I can't cut the TV on without sin. That's right. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You see? Second, well, uh, 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 listen to what it says about the church of Pergamos. Here's Jesus' warning. But I have a few things against you. You have some there that hold the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they may eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Compromise always begins when the believer's desires begin to match the desires of the world around them. You want to know when you compromise, Nancy? When you find out that your desires are just like the world around you. Wow. You want the same thing to people in the world who don't know Christ. Yeah. And what do the people in the world want? Everybody in the world want health, wealth, the prosperity, success, successful marriage, beautiful kids. Everybody, the unregenerate people want that. When your desires begin to match that, I'm here to tell you guys, I, this is exactly what begins to happen. Somebody says, where are you getting that from? What are the teachings of Balaam? Why did Balaam pro go, go prophesy? Does anybody know the story? Because the king of Moab offered him what? Money. But Balaam wanted the riches. And one of the Nicolaitans, we went over there before, the Nicolaitans were people who were just living licentiously. They were just pleasure teachers. As a matter of fact, I think it was one of the writers, the early church writers wrote about the Nicolaitans. He said they, he says they live like goats in heat. In other words, they just were like, just wow, do whatever you want to do. The warning to all churches is that the moment you begin to compromise with the world and the culture around you is the moment you put yourself in opposition with the Lord. That's why he tells that church, he tells those believers, if you don't repent, I'm coming to make war with you. Notice that Jesus is still talking to his church. He says, if you don't repent, if you people in that church don't repent, I'm coming to make war with you. Y'all gonna come deal with me. Well, what is the next slide? The church of Thyatira. What is that? Thirdly, after you begin to lose your first love first, secondly, you begin to compromise. What is Thyatira? Now you're just tolerating false teachers, false doctrine, unrepentant sin in your life, and you look more like the world than you do Christ. Now we can't even tell who you are. The church of Thyatira receives the strongest rebuke from the Lord, which gives us his, a clear understanding of how the Lord feels about tolerating sin, tolerating false teachers, and follow, tolerating false doctors. Are y'all listening? Mm -hmm. I don't even got to say nothing. I'm just going to read what Jesus said to the church of Thyatira. Are y'all listening? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read what he said to the church. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed. That word is not sick bed. That's not a hospital bed. That's a death bed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, you have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, but hold fast what you have. Until I come. Notice that to the church of Thyatira, the believers in that church, here's what Jesus says. If you want to tolerate sin, you want to tolerate false teachers, you want to tolerate false doctrine, Jesus says to those who commit adultery with that false teacher and start, what is the commit adultery? Notice he says commit adultery. What does that mean? If you commit adultery, what does that mean? You're married. Right. So who is he talking to? Uh, Come on, Kevin. Why is he talking to believers, Lindsay? Because you're married to Christ. You've been a spouse to Christ. That's why he says you're committed. To, when you go after false teachers, when you go after false doctors, when you live with unrepentant sin, you are committing adultery mm -hmm. against Christ. And listen to what he says, Nancy. You want to keep tolerating that unrepentant sin? You want to keep tolerating false teachers and false doctrine? I will throw you into great tribulation. Do you know what that means? Those that are tolerating false, unrepentant sin, those that are tolerating false teachers, false doctrine, Jesus says you're going into tribulation. He says unless you repent. 
And then watch this, man. This is to all those who are birthed out of the false teachers. Not only are you following the false teacher, you're the second generation of false teachers. What does Jesus say to them? I'm going to kill them. He says, I'm going to strike her children dead. Somebody says, well, why would Jesus say a thing like that? So all the churches will know that I'm the one who searches mind and heart. Jesus literally tells Thyatari, Elder Charles, can we bear this? That if y'all don't repent, I'm going to come and start killing people in the church. Well, why are you going to start killing people in the church, Jesus? So all the other churches will know. So if I start executing people in this church, all the other churches will know that if you tolerate sin, if you tolerate false doctrine, if you tolerate false teachers, you're in danger of being executed. I guarantee you people don't know Jesus like that. What about the church of Sardis? Look at this. So now you've left your false love, compromised, tolerating. Now fourthly, you're just going through the motions. Outwardly, you look like you got life, but in reality, you're spiritually dead. The church of Sardis stands with, begins the last day believers who have deceived themselves into thinking that they're saved, but in reality, they're not. It is the religious people of the world that have an appearance of godliness, but deny the power of God. These are the people who go to church because it's convenient. These are your virtual signals. These are the people that are your social justice warriors. Look like they're doing the work of Christ. Mm. But realistically, they're spiritually dead. And listen to what he says to Thyatara. Ain't much. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works completed in the sight of God. Remember then what you have, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what I or I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis. People who have not sold their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Notice that he tells those people who are playing like that, you're going to get left behind too. Mm -hmm. And then finally you have the church of Laodicea. Mm -hmm. What a slide. 30 years after Paul wrote Timothy. What does he say to Laodicea? Finally, this is the church who has abandoned the truth and sound doctrine. They've gone wholesale after the lies and false hopes of the world. The church of Laodicea is the apostate church that has completely abandoned and rejected the truth because they truly believe, Nancy, they have need of nothing. We good. We good. Look at us. Look at you. And look at us. How many you got? How much money you got? Look at what we do. That's the church of Laodicea. It is the rich, luxurious church. Oh my God! I I, I don't see how I don't see how we like. I know y'all get it. I just can't see how we can read these and just say, "Do you hear what this is saying?" Notice that the church of Laodicea says that they don't need nothing. What does that mean? That apostasy is not known to the person who's apostate. Hmm. You wonder why it's hard to talk to somebody who's apostate? Because they don't think they're apostate. Mm -hmm. When you try to talk to the truth, guess what you hear? I already know that. <coughs> I'm good. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to what Jesus tells the church. What does he tell that church? What does he say to the church? Mm -hmm. He says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I would just spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich and have prospered and in need of nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white with white garments so that you may be clothed yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salves to anoint on your eyes so that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Notice what he tells that church. 
the church, the, the, the last day church is so bad, Jesus says, y'all make me want to puke. I really believe that when Jesus looks at the church today, he's like, you know, you know, you, you have to stop it from coming up. You know, yeah, like he's look. You know, on Sunday when they have when they when you have service, Jesus is looking for a bucket. When the preacher gets ready to preach, it's nauseating to see people playing church. Preaching ridiculous sermons. Nothing but narcissistic messages to feed people's lust and desires for riches and wealth and all this stuff to get them greedy in the world. That's the church of Laodicea. And when we look at the profile, guys, it's sad. In Ephesus, we have a church made up of all believers and no unbelievers. That's how it began. You know. By the time we get to Pergamos, we have a church that is mostly made up of believers, but now there are some unbelievers in the crowd. By the time you get to Thyatira, you have unbelie more unbelievers than believers now. How do you know that? Because the believers in Thyatira are called the rest. By the time you get to Sardis, you have mostly unbelievers with now a few believers. Because in Sardis, Jesus calls the believers a few. When you get to Laodicea, you have a church full of all unbelievers. But guess what? In the midst of those unbelievers, there are the elect that's there that Jesus is telling to repent. That's what we're preaching to in these last days. That's why we preach what we preach. That's why we stand firm on what we preach. Because guys, I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm here to preach to you the truth of the scriptures and urge you and even myself, let's get ready for Christ's return. Get your heart out of this world. Yield your life to the work of the Holy Spirit. Immerse yourself in the truth. And hold on and patiently endure to the end. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand to your feet, guys. Well, y'all go. We'll get ready to go. Thank you guys for joining with us. Uh, I know the video went out on Facebook. I think we got it back up there, so I hope you guys were able to tune in. Uh, you can also, we're going to put this up online. It'll be on YouTube, on our YouTube page. So please go to our YouTube page and, and listen to this. You're going to want to hear this again. This is a good word for all believers. This is a word for the church. So I'm just encouraging you guys. And I hope it will be really beneficial to you. And to you. So we'll see you on Sunday. God bless.